very important webinar which is on uh, over test over treatment and over diagnosis it's a very timely topic and this topic and the webinar has created a reasonable amount of interest as well and uh, it's a very important topic considering the current context as well so therefore i thank uh, professor kumar mendis and the team for arranging and organizing this webinar and today we have a group of experts lined up to discuss different issues that are related to our diagnosis and our treatment and our first speaker is professor kumar mendis without further ado i would like to invite professor kumar mendis uh, who has specially interest in this topic and he is a professor of family medicine from university of kalania and has sort of international experience and expertise related to this area or to professor kumar mendis thank you indika uh we have a can can you share the the screen for me i will just open up the presentation okay i think everything is in place now so thank you very much uh, indika and the slma for uh, sponsoring this for the second year uh, because we had the initial uh, over diagnosis uh, seminar in 2019 uh and thank you for the speakers for agreeing uh, to speak on this uh, important topic so <sighs> medicine was born with the first expression of suffering and the first desire to elevate this suffering as this italian historian uh, says medicine's goal is to alleviate patient suffering the old paradigm of symptoms defining diseases what has happened now the old paradigm was the patients felt that he or she is sick he is currently suffering he is looking for help the patients and he and the doctor talked in a similar language of symptoms and signs as a result the patient has a say in whether or not he is sick and the consequent interventions that he wants this is the old paradigm that we were brought up in in the 20th century this has all changed science has empowered medicine it has created machines machines can see small things within living bodies that naked eyes cannot see as a result science has subverted the concept of disease and revamped the practice of medicine so the new paradigm machines define diseases the patient does not feel he is sick he has no current sufferings disease is only a risk factor for the future suffering he is not seeking help but being offered help he and the doctor are talking different languages as a result the patient has lost his power in determining whether or not he is sick and the consequent interventions so there has been a paradigm change in how we practice and how we treat patients one last slide before i define what over diagnosis this is a very old slide uh i got this from the 10 great public health achievements if you see the life expectancy in the 1900 it was about 47 years in the usa and 2000 it is supposed to be 77 the contribution of increase years of 25 years out of this 30 has been attributed to public health measures and only 5 due to increase years due to medical 
medicinal care and advances. And this is being, uh, the slide is taken from the, the country that spends 19% on health and technologically far ahead of others. So what is overdiagnosis? Overdiagnosis occurs when an individual are diagnosed with conditions that will never cause symptoms or death. Overdiagnosis can occur only when a doctor makes a diagnosis of symptoms preferable to the condition. While this can happen when a doctor stumbles onto an unexpected diagnosis in the course of an evaluation of unrelated conditions, generally it happens because doctors seek early diagnosis either as part of an organized screening effort or during routine exams, examinations. So overdiagnosis is a consequence of enthusiasm for early diagnosis. If you put this in one sentence, again, I'm borrowing this slide from uh, the editor of the BMJ. Overdiagnosis is a toxic combination of vested interest and good intentions. This was the president of the College of General Practitioners, quoted by Fiona Godley. What makes this happen? What drives overdiagnosis? This slide was taken again by one of our uh, Sri Lankan doctors working in Australia, Tanya Patirana, uh, who put in one picture all the drivers, I'm not going to uh, go one by one, but she categorized these driving factors into culture, health system, industrial and technology, professionals, patients and public. I will just take some cultural. We all believe that more is better, more diagnosis, more drugs, Sometimes the doctor, I mean, if, we, if a patient has paid for a consultation, it is, they expect some drugs. And if the drug is a little bit expensive, so much the better. And healthcare system, financial in incentives, and the expanding of disease definitions. The classic example is, when the blood pressure definition was dropped by a single study a few years ago, and they tried to define hypertension 120 by 70 or 80. Right. And it's industry and technology, industry promotions, the diagnostics test sensitivity becoming much more narrower so that very small things can pick up. And professionals, we fear litigation. I mean, what will I do if I miss this diagnosis? Fear of missing a disease, lack of confidence or knowledge, and also the patients and public. Expectations that clinicians will do something. There's some medicine for all ails, ailments. This is the perception from the patient's point of view. So in one of these, and uh, Dr. Patirana has given some of the things that we could do for every overdriving cause. So my next part of the thing, uh, my presentation will be, uh, what package for an annual checkup? I, I hope that you have a fair bit of understanding of what overdiagnosis is now and the driving factors. So I am just going to discuss what package for an annual checkup because there are so many packages. First, we will define what a general health check is because that is important. A general health checkup or annual physical or various names are being given, is a visit dedicated solely to preventive counseling and screening test. Here we are talking about screening and counseling in addition to prevention 
prevention measures that occurs during routine medical care. It is very clear. What I did this morning, I mean, I was just, I, I think you used the word general health check Sri Lanka and browse the internet. So I'm going to just go through some of the uh, websites that I came across, right? These are available for any person browsing general health checkups. Right. Some hospitals gave a variety of packages. Executive, healthy living, uh, whole body check, senior citizens, where I think my category is diabetic care, but without charges. And some gave charges from about 4,500 to 50,000. Again, naming certain packages. Some offered very simple, outpatients 10,000, inpatients 36,000. Some even tours, some leading tour people offered health packages. So tourism, health tourism, you come here, get a checkup done, and also see our beautiful country. I bounce about a health care package that came up in one of these, the single thing that I was looking for general. Some of these packages are not available out of stock, it says, right? It was really cheap. Right, I ultimately found the package I was looking for, health packages for over 50 years of men. Middle-aged men experience fatigue, inability, uh, irritability, loss of libido, depression, impaired memory, and erectile problems. You will benefit from an and andropause check. And this was, uh, I think, affordable even uh, with my university pay, so I settled for this. So this is a cross-section of what you will find. Now, did our, the, the people and the uh, institutions and private and public or anything, do, did they create all this? No. It came very, very early. I got a very authentic, um, uh, document from the World Health Organization, which uh, the principles and practice of screening. And it says in 1861, a person called Dobel uh, gave the first indication for periodic health examinations. And in and the commission advocated screening test only as a substitute to personal medical examinations, recognizing that shortage of manpower made universal routine examinations impossible. So it came with a very good intention, early days. Then came on the life insurance industry. Even in mid-1800, they got this. And they thought this was a good investment to uh, promote life insurance. So with the first one-time examination for applicants, they made it very easily annual checkups. And they even did research. And the institution called Life Extension Institution, there's a study that showed a relative mortality risk reduction range, ranging from 18% to 53% with a different follow-up. So insurance picked this up and did studies and said you get a very good benefit, but they got also a lot of financial gain from this. The JAMA produced the first periodic health examination manual for physicians in 1923. And the National Health Council, American Medical Association, US Public Health Service, all, I mean, 
you may think that you have heard that if you are birthday you can your wife or husband can give you a birthday present health examination this was promoted in 1923 right it, it is not original thinking of our own hospitals right have a health examination on your birthday and their target was to achieve 10 million examinations in 1923 and then the modern periodic health examination was almost institutionalized and the national health survey says right people are willing to do this we will do this going ahead then came two randomized controlled trials in 1963 64 60s mid 60s they had a follow up data of 7 and 16 years with 10000 adults and another with 7000 adults the main point was neither trial found significant differences in outcomes between study and control groups especially regarding overall mortality now this was a turning point then came two major canadian task force on periodic periodic health examination and united states preventive task force a panel formed by 1984 these two studies and the the evidence based first study came from jama itself in 2013 general health checks in adults for reducing morbidity and mortality from diseases they summarized this is a systematic review 14 randomized controlled trials of health checks involving 182000 patients there was no significant effect on mortality that was the main point that primary uh, outcome and also there were no significant reduction in cardiovascular mortality or cancer mortality with doing periodic health checks this was a turning point and the last bit of evidence came in 2019 the same team this was a cochrane review now you all know cochrane review 50% or more the summary will include a thing like we need much more evidence in this now this was quite different the plain language summary the key message systematic uh offers of health checks are unlikely to be beneficial and may lead to unnecessary test and treatment it is very very rare for cochrane to uh, come out with this kind of statement we will if we go into a little bit on this right for this they found 17 randomized control trials of all adults and from the 17 15 trials for Uh, chosen the number was 250000 or more and implications for research now this is very very strong i have this is probably the strongest uh, uh, worded uh, uh, cochrane review i have seen we see no reason to do more trials for general health checks as it seems futile based on the large amount of data and the fact that the results of previous trials have now been confirmed by recent raj trials is very very strong words i would like to end by what they stated for implications for practice our results do not support the use of general health checks aimed at a general population on the other hand they do not imply either that a physician should stop clinically motivated testing and preventive activities as such activities may be an important reason why an effort of general health checks has health been checks has been. lastly public health initiatives to systematically offer general health checks and offer from private suppliers of general health checks are not supported by the best evidence and thank you and we will we have i think decided the panel of speakers to take all questions at the end 
So it is my pleasure now to introduce Dr. Samila De Silva, Senior Lecturer in Medicine. I think you all know uh, uh, Dr. De Silva. With her, she's a very dynamic figure and involved in our ethics committee. So over to you, Samila, from the Department of Medicine, University of Kalania, the head of the department, Dr. Samila De Silva. Thank you, Professor Mendes. I hope everybody can hear me and my screen is visible to everybody. Yes, you can hear yes, me. Can. Okay. I will be talking mostly about the general medical aspect. A pill for every ill, where are we going wrong? Thank you to the SLMA and to Professor Mendis for inviting me to deliver this lecture. So let's start with William Shakespeare. He says through one of his characters, why then can one desire too much of a good thing? And this is what we are talking about today. Too much of a good thing, too much medicine, too much screening, investigations, diagnosis, treatment, adverse reactions, monitoring, too much of healthcare. I will be speaking a few things which are overlapping with what Prof Mendes talked about, but let me take you on with a case study. We'll start with a case study. A 32-year-old previously healthy woman complains of lower abdominal pain and dysuria for two days. Examination confirms suprapubic tenderness. Now, this is a very simple, straightforward suggestion or clinical suggestion that this is a urine infection, simple urine infection, possibly a cystitis in a sexually active previously healthy woman. But she is admitted. She undergoes a panel of testing, including an ultrasound abdomen, in the hope that not only will you prove the diagnosis, but also we will make sure that there are no other problems, no other problems affecting this person to find any other problems that could be there. She's diagnosed to have cystitis and she's treated with intravenous antibiotics. That's the first case study. Here is a case study too. A 36-year-old man is on lipid lowering therapy for the past six years after a routine health check detected slightly elevated cholesterol. He has no other cardiometabolic risk factors. Despite persistently normal cholesterol reports, his physician continues lipid lowering therapy. The patient also diligently does his panel of investigations, lipid profiles, blood sugars, liver and renal profiles every month, thinking that something will be detected, something wrong will be detected. I'm sure both these scenarios are quite familiar to you, particularly case number two. In 2012, the BMJ dedicated a series of uh, articles to overdiagnosis. And the BMJ says medicine's much held ability to help the sick is fast being challenged by its propensity to harm the healthy. A rising scientific literature is fueling public concerns that too many people are overdosed, overtreated, and overdiagnosed. So, what drives this overdiagnosis? I know Prof. Mendes has touched on the drivers before. I would like to simplify it into six major areas. Number one, first driver of overdiagnosis, as mentioned before, is technological advances. New, more powerful, less invasive technologies for diagnosis and treatment. And you use this in a poorly controlled fashion, there will obviously be overdiagnosis. Good example, these so-called full body CT and MRI scans to detect early stage carcinoma. I have seen paper advertisements for this in this country. Misconceptions of utility. The mistaken belief that more is better. Blind, untested faith in early detection that is not substantiated by evidence. You have to detect everything early. More is better. Good example, mammograms in young women with no family history of breast carcinoma. Treatment by committee. 
Conflicted panels driven by political correctness, desiring to please everybody, producing more definitions and writing conciliatory guidelines. What is called the consensus of the ill-informed. Now, let me make myself clear. I have no problems with guidelines. I think guidelines are a very good framework on which we can base our practice, have a reference framework when we are in doubt. But we have to be very careful, particularly when we are not sure about the panels have conflict of, whether the panels have conflicts of interest. Vested interests. Again, familiar to all of you, doctor-owned facilities, private for-profit medical businesses, doctors in the pay of business interests, sitting on various panels, deciding on guidelines, deciding on what people should be doing, the hand-in-purse situation. No examples, I think you know what I'm talking about. Another big driver of overdiagnosis is defensive medicine. Physicians who think, I don't think it is needed, but I better do this to cover my back. Fear of malpractice and the ever-increasing threat of litigation. And then panel preference, what we talked about in the case studies. The whole kitchen sink, not just the spoons. Do everything. Order a range of tests so that one or two, you know, one or two will probably be enough. But let's do everything because we might pick up something that is wrong. These are the drivers of overdiagnosis. Let's take some common examples, things that everybody is familiar with. There are studies that show that about 30% of patients who carry the diagnosis of asthma actually do not have asthma. And about 66% of patients who are diagnosed as asthma may actually not require medication. Breast cancer, another controversial area. Up to one third of mammographically detected cancers may be overdiagnosed. CKD, chronic kidney disease. The present criteria that uses a formula and uses the creatinine value to determine the uh, GFR, the estimated GFR, classifies one in 10 adults in this world as having chronic kidney disease. And this formula takes account of the age, but not enough. And it overdiagnoses CKD in the elderly because the routine, the normal reduction in renal function, the normal loss of renal function, loss of GFR with aging is not taken into account in the classification. So you have 90 year old patients who are perfectly well, getting about their routine day to day work with some difficulty, who are diagnosed as having end stage kidney disease purely because of their age. High blood pressure. I think we all have experience in this. One reading, maybe two readings of high blood pressure and the patient is started on treatment. Substantial overdiagnosis at all levels of physicians. High cholesterol, like in my example previously. Up to 80% of people with near normal cholesterol treated for life as hypercholesterolemia may be overdiagnosed. Prostate cancer, again, a very controversial area. If you use PSA testing, elevated PSA testing, there is overdiagnosis of about 60% of people as having prostate cancer. So overdiagnosis is making pa people patients unnecessarily by identifying problems that were never going to cause harm by medicalizing ordinary life experiences through expanded definitions of disease. I will, I will talk about this in some detail later. And the major causes of overdiagnosis can be divided into overdetection as well as overdefinition of disease. So what is overdetection? Pretty simple, really. Identification of abnormalities that were never going to cause harm or do not progress or progress too slowly to cause any symptoms during the remaining lifetime of the patient or they resolve spontaneously. And one of the main reasons why overdetection detection is fast becoming a problem is the use of high resolution diagnostic technologies 
that increase the risk of overdetection. A good example, high resolution CT scanning angio can identify very small pulmonary emboli. So are you going to treat this patient? Are you going to investigate this patient for a thrombotic tendency? Are you going to put the patient on long-term warfarin? They probably may not even need any treatment because they're completely asymptomatic otherwise. Here is another example of overdiagnosis. Let's take the example of a woman called Maria who developed a small, slow-growing breast cancer in her 50s or 60s. So there are two possible scenarios of what could happen to Maria. Scenario one, she has screening and her cancer is found and she is diagnosed and she has treatment. Scenario two, Maria does not have screening. Her cancer is never diagnosed and it never affects her health. In both scenarios, Maria lives to the age of 85 and then dies of an unrelated heart disease. So her lifespan is the same, whether or not she has had screening. So if she has screening, she experiences overdetection, a diagnosis and a treatment that's, that she does not need. And this is an example of overdiagnosis. Then there is, so this is overdetection once again. Now, so overdetection is fueled by sophisticated self-testing technologies, greater access to tests, commercial incentives. We are all familiar with patients who come and ask, can I have a PSA done? Can I have a mammogram done? Why? No reason. I just want to reassure myself. We are all familiar with that. And we are all familiar with physicians who alter the whole gamut of self-testing technologies. The more tests you order, the more likely you are to diagnose the so-called disease. And there is little evidence sometimes that early detection actually improves patient outcome. Because remember, whatever we do, we have to be outcome driven. We have to make sure that what we do actually improves patient outcome. Here is a good example of overdetection. Age standardized thyroid cancer screening in South Korea. From 1999 to 2008, incidence increased 6.4 fold, but 95% were small and detected mainly through screening. However, mortality from thyroid cancer, the green line, remained the same irrespective of this huge increase in the diagnosis. So the outcome has remained the same, although screening has increased exponentially. And this is why overdetection is a problem. Use of advanced imaging can lead to overdetection by finding incidental omas, surprise abnormalities unrelated to the original reason for doing the test. Example, a CT test is done to follow up on a pulmonary nodule and it detects a small adrenal incidental omas. So what to do? You can take two paths. You can get very excited. There is an adrenal tumor. I need to investigate this patient greatly, look into adrenal function, think of more advanced uh, uh, radiological screening to see what is going on. Or you can take a watch and wait attitude. Because it is not always possible to know which abnormalities are likely to progress. And that is a problem. Because we are always driven by what happens at the end, we are always outcome driven and we need to know which abnormalities are likely to progress. And sometimes the data is not freely available. Then there is this second problem of overdefinition that Prof Kumar touched on before. Two areas, lowering the threshold factor for a risk factor, threshold for a risk factor without adequate evidence that doing so helps people feel better or live longer. Classic example is the 2013 US cholesterol guidelines. This recommended the use of statins for primary prevention of cardiovascular disease in low-risk adults. 
low risk adults huge numbers the numbers of adults treated by statins went went up hugely but retrospective analysis did not show that there was actually an improvement in mortality or cardiovascular morbidity so that is not good you lower the threshold for a risk factor but you are doing it without adequate evidence sometimes there may even be pharma interference in these decisions number 2 is expanding disease definitions to include patients with ambiguous or very mild symptoms we all know that hypertension is asymptomatic and there are lots of controversies about what is high blood pressure and what is low blood pressure ama american medical association and the american heart association have released new revised blood pressure categories and here i will draw your attention to this little chart at the top on your top right hand corner high blood pressure stage 1 is systolic of 130 to 139 or diastolic 80 to 89 even a blood pressure of 120 to 129 systolic and diastolic less than 80 is considered elevated blood pressure so what this is doing is one in three americans is currently diagnosed to have high blood pressure by these revised guidelines one in three adult americans has high blood pressure it will take time for us to see whether this is a good thing or a bad thing because obviously we will have to look at outcome after these new guidelines come into effect to see whether picking up more patients categorizing them labeling them as having high blood pressure actually does anything from the point of view of mortality and morbidity driven by hypertension over definition also extends to treating risk factors as diseases and lowering the thresholds for risk factor based diagnosis which has dramatically increased the prevalence of many diseases this let me take on at this point something controversial pre diabetes now all all of you know that diabetes is diagnosed with a fasting blood sugar of 126 or more on two or more occasions or with symptoms but over the last few years about 10 to 15 years pre diabetes became a concept where your fasting blood sugar is between 100 to 125 and the patient is categorized as having pre diabetes the risk is lower than those diagnosed under earlier definitions but there are conflict there is conflicting evidence on the one hand large numbers of people referring this chart on your top right hand corner large numbers of people are now diagnosed to have pre -di diabetes across the world in all communities on the other hand there is evidence that only 1 in 10 people with pre diabetes will progress to diabetes annually 1 in 9 people will not then there are other studies which show that pre diabetes actually carries a higher risk of cardiovascular disease in the long term so there is conflicting evidence absolutely conflicting evidence but the very diagnosis of pre diabetes has increased the prevalence of many diseases like diabetes and labeling and treatments that offer little benefit due to low risk can have important physical psychological social and financial consequences the jury is still out on pre diabetes but you have to be very careful when you label people with a particular disease without adequate evidence and then finally there is overselling which is promoted by over definition of disease these supposed diseases may be unpleasant life experiences that many people experience occasionally like trouble falling asleep feeling sad because of some event that has occurred in your life or difficulty in focusing because of stress or some other problem that is going on at work or in your personal life but overselling moves that line separating the normal from the abnormal and people with very mild symptoms get diagnosed as depressed or insomniacs 
whatever they get they get a, a, a diagnosis and a label struck on now i'm not trying to take away from the minority who have intense or debilitating symptoms and they need treatment you see i'm not talking about that i'm talking about the vast majority who have just unpleasant life experiences and from this we lead on to disease mongering which may be done to sell more drugs as a marketing strategy let me remind you of a, a milk powder company in sri lanka some years ago added some calcium to their milk powder and started this massive marketing campaign where they were basically saying postmenopausal women will become will develop fractures will become dependent will become debilitated if they don't drink their milk which contains calcium i think you know what i'm talking about i'm sure a lot of you have seen the advertisements as well basically making aging normal aging and menopause into a disease disease mongering and prof kumar touched on this again low testosterone andropause again a normal physiological sequence of aging is being made into a disease so ladies and gentlemen i hope i have convinced you over diagnosis is harmful as well as costly it can lead to over treatment and the way to prevent and minimize over diagnosis is by evidence based medicine more research is needed on studies on the natural history of disease watchful waiting trials when there are very small or ambiguous abnormalities studies of effects of diagnostic language intervention studies on known drivers of overdiagnosis studies of how to involve patients in decisions about diagnosis what strategies to use very much more research is needed and we also must ensure as the medical community that new disease definitions are based on evidence based on evidence and not on financial interest so thank you once again to professor mendis and to the slma for inviting me to give this talk and i'll be more than happy to answer any questions you might have at the end of all the lectures thank you it is my pleasure now to introduce the next speaker uh, professor saman gunatilaka i think who needs no introduction he is a professor in medicine he was a chair professor in medicine at the jawardhanapur uh, department of medicine he is a very well known researcher and an even uh, better known educator he is my teacher as well and he will talk further on this subject the making of a patient over to you professor saman thank uh, thank you shamila for that very kind introduction and thank you slm and kumar for organizing organizing this and i'll have to start with a slide that you ended up with and my title is the making of patients a modern epidemic i'm going to have to repeat some of the things you ashramila uh, and kumar have said before i get on to my area of the talk this is a british author british writer and a philosopher he i think said about 20 years ago or about 30 years ago he said medical science has made such tremendous progress that there is hardly a healthy human left then in 2014 i, I wrote editorial in the ceylon medical journal on over diagnosis and treatment and recently in 2018 i wrote this editorial to the journal of the ceylon college of physicians when a patient came to see me and said doctor i have to take 54 tablets a day and also some injections now this was a young patient 39 years old who had pituitary surgery 5 years ago 
but now has diabetes. So this is the introduction to my talk. Then as uh, you have already mentioned, there are man-made epidemics. The American Diabetes Association 2010, in their guidelines, according to their guidelines, the pre-diabetes was introduced. And, you, and if you apply these criteria to China, over half of the Chinese adults, 493 million have pre-diabetes. Same with chronic kidney disease. If we apply the current or 2012, guidelines on diagnosis of chronic kidney disease to the American population, then about 14% of American adults can be labeled as having CKD. So this is seen, this can be seen even in other conditions like lipid levels, prehypertension, PSA screening, and osteoporosis. I already have said this, and this is this article in the BMJ which said medicines much held. Ability to help the sick is fast being challenged by its propensity to harm the health. A burgeoning scientific literature is failing public concerns that too many people are overdosed, overtreated, and overdiagnosed. So overdiagnosis, as we know today, is People without symptoms are diagnosed with a disease that ultimately will not cause them to experience symptoms or early death. And this leads to over-medicalization, over-treatment, and unneeded tests, waste of time, and waste of resources. So what are the drivers of over-diagnosis? I think uh, Kumar has mentioned it, so I can kind of rush through this. Uh, I will come to some examples in due course. Yeah, so we have gone through the technological advances like, you know, sophisticated scans, detecting even very small abnormalities, screening programs, conflicted panels producing expanded disease definitions and writing guidelines. We have gone through this, so I won't uh, spend much time on this, but uh, well, the cultural beliefs, health system incentives, and also, finally, doctor-owned facilities. These are also generally not uh, encouraged. Like if you take the other countries, in certain countries, this is not possible even. Like to have your own lab, have your own hospital, because it tends to, or have your own pharmacy, because you will try to prescribe more, investigate more unnecessarily. And this is mongering is another term, and that is the creation and extension of disease or pathological boundaries for profit. And that's disease mongering. Yeah, so these are the key elements. Exaggerate the prevalence of disease. That is, you have broad disease definitions and publicize large prevalence estimates. And then blur mild and severe disease, like pre-diabetes and diabetes. After some time, you forget that the patient has pre-diabetes and you start on treatment. Same with hypertension, same with lipid levels. You can blur mild and severe disease and start medication. And then you encourage more diagnosis by media, by companies for gain. You highlight that doctors fail to diagnose. You encourage self-diagnosis and then promote disease awareness. We have these awareness weeks, awareness days. We go for walks and we have support groups. And sometimes these support groups are funded by drug companies. And also you suggest that all should be treated. And you imply there's no downside to treatment. You don't talk about side effects. You don't talk about the downside. You emphasize only on the positive effects. And also you imply that long-term treatment is safe and effective. Yeah, so if you change the rules and apply these, now cholesterol 
according to this, the five millimoles, or it's about 5.7, and systolic blood pressure more than 140, diastolic more than 90. Now, so if it's higher than that, then it's abnormal. So if you apply this to this population of Norwegians who are 20 to 79 years old, 62,000 people, and it was found that 76% of adults have unfavorable risk for profile. The prevalence by age 24 with these criteria, 50%. And by age 49, 90% had cholesterol more than five, systolic blood pressure more than 140, diastolic more than 90 in this survey. But Norway is one of the healthiest countries in the world, world's longest living and healthiest living population. So there is something wrong somewhere. Same with uh, cholesterol, we, we, we've spoken about this before, but graphically, I think if you look at this, the cholesterol is a biological variant. So you can, if you draw a graph like this against the population and the cholesterol levels, you get this curve. And if the cholesterol levels to be lowered, I think long time ago, it was 240 was the cutoff. Then it was brought to 200. And now I think it has been even lower to about sometimes 170. So what happens? So if it was only 240 or more, the number of patients are this much. The moment you bring it down to 200, there's a huge number of new patients. So you're adding a large number of new patients. So if, and I'm sure the drug companies who promote statins, who has interest in statins would be more in, interested and would very much favor if we can bring it down to here. But then what happens? Half the population have high cholesterol. That can't be right. Yeah, so if you take 100 patients, diagnosed with just above normal cholesterol and treated for their lifetimes, what happens? There are only eight winners. That is, you treat them for lifetime and you save or you prevent only eight major heart events. 14, despite treatment of the statins, develop heart events. And 78 are taking it, taking it for nothing and nothing happens to them. They die of something else. So this is the problem of over-treatment and over-diagnosis. Same with blood glucose. We, we, I think uh, said, Shamila said, about, talked about this, but if you have high blood sugar of 140, and these abnormality, the 140, and these are treatment benefit. So when you treat 140 blood sugar, treatment benefit is very high or significant. But if you start treating 126 blood pressure, borderline of pre-diabetes, then the treatment benefit is much less. But there are a large number of patients in this category, not so much here. So the target should be to treat these people so that you can sell more and more of your products. But the benefit they gain is much less than, yeah. So these, showing you the figures, this table is for US adult population. And there's a little big number there, maybe 187 million people. Diabetes. If we apply the old definition, these are the number. New definition, this number. And there are new cases, 1,681,000. Hypertension, with the new definitions, you have 13 million, 13 and a half million. Lipids. When you lower the definition, 42 million. 
right? And obesity is another thing that you get. So look at the increase, 14% increase, 35% increase, 86% increase here with lipid levels being lower. And 40, because half the population is there and being overweight. So these are the new patients and this is how mean we make new patients. And you can exaggerate results. And these are the best ways of doing it. The relative risk factor, relative risk reduction. And you can have major kind of headlines saying screening cuts the death rate by half. Half is 40%. It's almost 50%. So write the headline saying screening for certain condition cuts the death rate by half. So everybody who sees it, it's feels that oh, this is a major finding, major thing, and that we must all take it. But what is really the truth? The truth is death rate is reduced from 3.4 per thousand to 1.9 over five years. So it's three people dying per thousand reduced to two, only one death less with the treatment or the screen. But if you apply the relative risk reduction, then it is 44% reduction. So you say half. So you can exaggerate results or mislead by using the wrong statistic. Then the media will catch up on this and they will come up with these headlines. This is about uh, restless leg syndrome, which is a rare condition, not easy to diagnose. A lot of people, of course, don't know much about this, how to do that. But this is how the British media, you know, started this campaign. Driven to despair by years of sleepless nights, patients have become suicidal. About half reported that the syndrome is undiagnosed by physicians and also relatively few doctors know about restless legs. These are the most common disorder your doctor has never heard of. This is the media campaign. Many people can suffer in silence for years before it is recognized. These are major newspaper headlines. Then we can have awareness weeks, awareness days. World Stroke Day. And you can put these huge posters saying one in six people worldwide will have a stroke in their lifetime. But stroke can be prevented. Yeah, this is good, good public education, but the way you do it is the problem. And also you can add a little bit at the bottom. It can be you. The moment you said that, everyone wakes up. Oh, yeah, so we must do something. And then we do these, the walks, to make the public aware. But uh, if you see people or doctors walking like that on your street, probably you will be very frightened. What's, what's happening? Why, why is this? Is, there's a, is there a catastrophe of strokes? Or is there a huge epidemic of dementia? Or is it something wrong with heart attack? People will be so, can be frightened. So it has to be the way you do it. And I, I find it similar to these two pictures at the bottom. And we can put a big banner there saying, make hemiplegics walk again or something. And block the roads. Or like in political rallies. But how much of these works, no one knows. But the, sometimes it has been seen in other countries that the support groups are being financed, funded by interested farm. Then the incidental findings, what are called incidental lomas. Like you pick up the stone and you find something else. And this is very common in neurology as well as in other things. Like if patient comes to see you for a headache. I've seen this many times happening. 
headache, but you run a, run a series of tests, you know, commonly the blood sugar and lipid levels, and you find a high lipid level, not very high, borderline. So you tell the patient, well, you have high cholesterol, and you start treating. And the headache is forgotten. He goes away, the headache is forgotten because now he has high cholesterol and he takes the cholesterol for life. That's one incident room. And also you can find things like that. In healthy volunteers, gallstones are there in about 10%. A damaged knee cartilage in about 40%. Bulging discs in the back, in the spine, in half, 50% and silent cerebral infarcts in about 15 percent. Yeah, so if you take what you call silent infarcts, they may be not really infarcts sometimes, they may be small, what, you, what we call them small vessel disease, closing down of small vessels which are usually asymptomatic, and it keeps going up in the age, and which is a normal finding. But the danger or the problem is some physicians, some doctors would show these to patients and say, well, you had silent strokes and make the patient, make that normal person a patient. Some would go even more and count these. One, two, three, four, five. And would tell the patient, well, you had five strokes in the past. And these are patient who has no symptoms, who's quite asymptomatic. So made him a patient and he's going to be sick after that. This is another thing. We do a scan for headache. We come across these sometimes. Not common, but we come across this. So if you don't know what this is, then you will put fear into the patient but these are normal congenital cysts that you find in a lot of people, not a lot in, in certain number of people, which doesn't need any treatment unless they cause epilepsy. That is also rare. You don't need to do anything, but these are some things that you find. And if you don't handle it properly, you convert that person into a very seriously diseased person. Yeah, this is another problem. You do a cervical spine x-ray for neck pain or headache, and you find this. But these are probably most of the time asymptomatic. They don't cause problems. If you do cervical spine x-rays in, in people about 60 years old, you will find these changes. These are age-related changes, but sometimes more in some people. But the danger is, what do we tell the patient? And the famous thing is in singular to tell the patient, and the moment the patient hears this, he gets panicked. Because he's after that, he's not going to move his neck, he's going to protect his neck, and sometimes they end up wearing colors and all kinds of things. So you made him a patient for life. Then these are the normal things that you find when you do MRI scan, these disc bulge, which are quite benign. You don't need to do any, anything for them. All you need to advise is to be careful not to aggravate this problem because there can be a disc herniation. But these are also don't need any treatment. Yeah. So let's uh, get on to my final part. Yeah. So this all tells us, us all about our patients too. Here you, is a problem where you, the wife says you worry too much. It doesn't do any good. Well, we have patients like this who worries too much and they would like to have a diagnosis. They would like to have symptoms. They would like to have treatment. And the man says, well, it does for me worrying too much because 95% of the things I worry about never happen. Yeah, let me deal a bit on the psychiatry 
Well, this is the Bible of the psychiatry specialty, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. When this edition, the fifth edition was to be published, there was a big rumpus. There were a lot of uh, critical, uh, criti uh, crit criticization of certain recommendations of this, and they had to revise certain things. Yeah, psychiatry was once upon a time reserved for only the most distressed members of the society. That was before 1970s. Then in 1980, 1984, these editions of the DSM came up and they came up with a lot of new diagnosis. And in 2011, in the United Kingdom, there were 47 million prescriptions for antidepressants. And the new conditions which were described are called, and is all ordinary experience, attenuated psychotic risk syndrome. These are young people sometimes who have, you know, who hear something, who sees something, young people, and they were thought to have this attenuated psychotic risk syndrome. I think that after it was removed after that uh, in new edition. Then you have the adjustment disorder related to bereavement. That is somebody dies and a patient is bereaved, or the person is bereaved for a little longer period than normal. He was diagnosed as adjustment disorder related to bereavement. Then female sexual dysfunction and premenstrual dysphoric disorder. Premenstrual dysphoric disorder is, is the premenstrual syndrome and they kind of the companies came up with this brilliant idea. The drug to be used is an antidepressant for this, Prozac, yeah, that's fluoxetine. Prozac was a very high selling drug at that time in US, but they didn't want to give Prozac to these patients, like, but they wanted to give fluoxetine is the treatment. So they put it in a different form gave it a different name, which is appealing to the females, calling seraphim, and put a color which the females like, the pink and lavender, and marketed for premenstrual dysphoric disorder. The same drug, but with a different name. So the strategies for marketing. Then uh, in an editorial in BMJ, they said DSM-5 is a fatal diagnosis query because it was medicalizing ordinary experiences. If you're worried about having an illness, it's called somatic symptom disorder. If you have normal grief, you may even end up with a major depressive disorder. Forgetfulness of old age, mild neurocognitive disorder. Temper tantrums in children, common. Mood dysregulation disorder. Overeating, sometimes we all do this, was called binge eating disorder. The problem was of the people who wrote the DSM-5 task force, 72% of the members had ties with pharma. And it was realized only after they wrote it. So they, some people resigned, some people left it, and it was revised. Yeah, so finally, if I was not a doctor at my age, uh, as Kumar said, I'm older than all of you, uh, I have kind of taught Shehan, who's coming next. I have worked with Sharmila, with a junior colleague of mine, and Kumar, I also knew as a junior colleague when I was in Raghavan. So I might have a borderline hypertension. You check sometimes it is 140, sometimes, you know, maybe 90. So I would have borderline hypertension. I also get a bit of reflux, depending on what you eat, depending on what you drink then I may be diagnosed as GORD. Cold days, rainy days, you wake up sometimes to pass your ring and may be diagnosed benign prostatic heart Joints hurt in the mornings, osteoarthritis. And when there are a lot of things to do, I keep it's good to keep a list of things to do, keep a diary, which I don't sometimes, but I, I kind of do it. Maybe called 
early cognitive impairment and difficult to remember names as well. Yeah, I'm not very good at that. And also I like to keep things in order where yeah, things are nice, they kept, and it may be called obsessive compulsive disorder. So what would happen to me? I would be taking all these drugs if I was not a doctor, because I would be going for these health checks, frightened about all these hype, the media hype, do the checks what Kumar mentioned earlier, and I'll end up with all these drugs. And this is a real example of what happened to a priest. There is an 85 years old priest I saw about two months ago, and this is his prescription. When I found him, I, I didn't think there was anything wrong, but he came to see me because he was feeling dizzy. And I can't remember what else, but main problem was dizzy. And his blood glucose was about 110, 120. Blood pressure was low, about 100. Uh, I think it's too low for him, 85 years old. And his blood pressure was about 110, 120, 70. And these are the drugs he was on. Four drugs for his diabetes. The diabetes, I think, is a different area that we need to look at because they like to treat each and every enzyme in the glucose cycle, starting from wherever, up to the proximal tubule where the glucose is absorbed, they try to catch all the enzymes. So we have so many drugs hitting at each and every enzyme. Then the most dangerous thing is he is on motilium, 20 milligram three times a day for three months, and mosopride, five milligram three times a day for three months. Now, why on earth he has that is difficult to know. And if this prescription was given in US or UK, I'm sure he will be called and asked why. Because motilium is banned in US. Limited prescriptions in UK, you can't prescribe for a long period because they are dangerous in the sense they cause conduction problems like QT prolongations in especially in elderly people. Then he's on a lot of other drugs, totally unnecessary. He's on two vitamins, N1C, Activon, and he was on GABA, but he didn't really have symptoms to prescribe GABA. When I asked the priest, he said, well, I have a little numbness in my toes. And so many other drugs, Solficare is a, Solficare is uh, yeah, given for prostatic problems. He's an uh, anticholinergic. Then finasteride is antiandrogen. And Urimax is alpha blocker. On three drugs for his prostate problem, but which he didn't have. And no wonder he will feel dizzy. And also, in addition, he's on Ibabradi, which causes bradycardia. I'm surprised that he didn't faint or collapsed. So this is the treatment. He's a very respected priest, holds a very high position at the moment in, in the academic sphere. And this is the prescription he's taking. So ladies and gentlemen, it looks as if medicine is out of control. Throughout history, unscrupulous people have preyed on our universal fears of suffering and death and made money by selling dubious remedies. The hope that the growing scientific foundation for medical practice would consign such activity to historical oblivion has proved to be in vain. Newspapers and electronic media are used for advertising health screening packages when their value is still uncertain. The results of medical research are often distorted and suppressed for commercial gain, and systems that attempt to control clinicians' behavior through payment by results drive over diagnosis and over treatment. By medicalizing normality and expanding the boundaries of treatable illness, and therefore the number of potential patients 
many groups tend to benefit, but this is at considerable cost. The risks of arterogenic illness, the waste of limited resources, especially in poor countries, and the diversion of resources from the treatment of more important diseases. So this is bad medicine. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening. I think I will introduce the next speaker. Yeah, it's uh, Dr. Shehan Silva. It's a pleasure to introduce him because he is a Javadalpur graduate and he's been my student, one of the brilliant guys. He's a MD, MRCP, UK, and also he has MRCP in diabetes and endocrinology. He joined as a senior lecturer in the Faculty of Medical Sciences there recently, and he's a consultant physician and secretary of the Geriatric Association of Sri Lanka. Shehan, over to you. Oh, Saman, uh, now uh, I got a message from Dr. Shehan that he's restarting his computer. There's some problem with the computer. So mm -hmm. can we ask uh, Dr. Himan? Yeah, yeah. Can you introduce him? Well, I, I don't have the... Yes. Uh, uh, yes, uh, um, can you, can I can. You, yes. 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 Thank you very much yes. for joining, uh, yes. When I was searching for a, a rheumatologist because uh, the morbidity pattern, morbidity pattern, I will say why we were searching for a rheumatologist. We did a morbidity study at the Ragama um, outpatient department in 2017 and normally the respiratory diseases cover about one third but there was a, in 2017 there was a strikingly different pattern 20 percent of presenting complaints as we in general practice recent pain counters were musculoskeletal related so i contacted uh, the president of your college and you were uh, introduce. Thank you very much uh, for joining this and yes. uh, over to you. Right, thanks. Uh, so I'll share my screen. Um, so um, uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank uh, Professor Kumar Mendis uh, and Professor in the for organizing this wonderful seminar. Uh, it's, uh, it's an honor to uh, uh, do this talk uh, uh, with a few of my teachers as well here who are here in this seminar panel. Uh, so, and I, I would like to thank Dr. Duminda Munidas, our college president as well, uh, for uh, inviting me to do this lecture. My, my uh, le uh, lecture is themed as treatment of joint pain gone too far. Um, so, um, so I, I did an article uh, about one and a half years ago uh, uh, on arthritis as an emerging non-communicable disease in Sri Lanka. Now, some of the statements I made in this article, I would like to highlight. Um, uh, sorry. Um, the drugs that are dispensed as a BC, at a busy government clinic is staggering. And Sri Lankan patients are popular for their dependence on medication rather than reliance on lifestyle modification techniques. We are a nation uh, that fancies instant remedies than long-term methods of modifying the cause of the disease. And we see patients who are addicted to painkillers despite possessing a fair knowledge on drug side effects. With these statements in mind, I would like to uh, proceed to my next slide. This is the WHO fact sheets on musculoskeletal conditions. Now, musculoskeletal conditions are typically characterized by pain and are the leading contributor to disability worldwide. Low back pain is the single leading cause of disability globally. And musculoskeletal conditions are commonly linked with depression. The WHO fact sheet also mentions some risk factors for musculoskeletal conditions, which are inadequate physical activity, obesity, uh, smoking, and poor nutrition. And they mentioned that these can be managed easily in primary care through a combination of core non-pharmacological interventions such as exercise, weight management, and psychological therapies. Um, 
I would like to uh, discuss uh, briefly four aspects that can lead to medical overuse in musculoskeletal healthcare. So some of these topics have been discussed previously by um, uh, the professor, and uh, these are things like over detection, over definition, over treatment. I won't be uh, speaking about uh, over testing due to uh, time constraints. Uh, now, over diagnosis, there might be doctor related courses as well as uh, patient related courses. Um, and uh, some reasons for the doctors to overdiagnose musculoskeletal conditions. Now, uh, many patients might be uh, might have non-rheumatological diseases uh, servicing with musculoskeletal symptoms. Now, like things like depression, uh, there's this belief or myth that evaluating the underlying cause uh, is difficult because it's time-consuming, that uh, because it's physically exhausting, and because there are numerous causes for joint pain uh, and. Also, even after diagnosing a cause for joint aches, uh, explaining the underlying cause is considered as time consuming by some doctors. And also uh, there's this lack of patient interest in listening to the explanation as well. Now, attempting to correct the underlying cause is also time consuming and it won't please the patient who came for an instant remedy and not a lecture. So the easy way out for most doctors is to provide the patient with an easy musculoskeletal disease tag, like let's say degenerative disease of the spine, cartilage wear and tear, osteoarthritis, and give a tablet, a pain relief tablet. This is further supported by the large number of patients that the doctors see in government clinics. Uh, about over detection and over definition, um, unimportant findings are made prominent in over detection uh, now, this has been spoken before. Degenerative disease of the spine in an elderly patient is tagged as disease. What else to expect in an elderly patient rather than, uh, other than degenerative disease? Uh, and also, the definitions are changed so that novel diseases are created. Creating the label neuropathic low back pain has become a fashion, and use of pre gabbling has become a big issue even, in, uh, where, even at where I work, the North Central Province. There's a rise in pre gabbling poisoning and abuse here. Um, a few patient-centered reasons for overtreatment also are there, which I wish to highlight. Now, patient perspective on body aches have cha has changed. Now, how a patient perceives body aches has changed over the past few decades. There's this increasing willingness to report joint or muscle pain for cultural or social reasons, or there's this increased awareness of pain syndromes. And uh, there's re we notice reduced tolerance levels. Patients are unable to tolerate pain, or they just don't want to tolerate even the mildest amounts of pain, because there's this tempting thought that lurks in their mind that painkillers are available at 24-hour pharmacies. There are information age-related issues as well. <clears throat> the remedy is just a Google search away. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, there are plenty of options to choose from. Um, uh, if you do a Google search, if you do a Google search on osteoarthritis remedies, you will find more than 200,000 uh, remedies uh, or search findings. And there are, uh, uh, there's this availability of numerous over-the-counter meds. There are chemicals for everything, to reduce pain, to bring happiness, to bring extreme happiness or elation, for sleep, to cut off unpleasant senses. Um, and the non-medicinal methods of curing musculoskeletal uh, pain are disregarded lifestyle modifications are ignored, or there is lack of knowledge amongst patients on lifestyle modification methods. And instant pill-based cures are again preferred by the patients. So these are some of the issues that we face. I did a survey which was published in the Internal Journal of Rheumatic Disease, a survey on patient awareness on non-pharmacological treatment methods for knee osteoarthritis. Now, um, and some of the findings are very disappointing. Uh, say, for example, muscle strengthening exercises, only 37% of the patient population knew that it was useful in managing knee osteoarthritis. Walking canes, only 51% knew that it was useful in managing knee osteoarthritis. Um, I would like to speak a bit about Sri Lanka and hyperconsumerism as well. Uh, just two slides on this. Hyperconsumerism is uh, the consumption of goods in excess. Uh, we see this in among Sri Lankans and it's fueled by brands as people often form deep attachment to product brands. Uh, we are a nation that fancies buying new things and discarding the old. The product life cycle can be very short, measured sometimes in weeks. And we also fancy buying several items of the same product. 
two houses, two cars. Um, and it, this hyper consumerism uh, applies to over treatment as well. Believing that expensive medication shapes the patient's identity is a, is a challenge. Another feature of hyper consumerism, uh, which we see, is reliance on treatment regimes are very short. It's measured sometimes in days. Like there's folly farms, which is uh, fancied by all our patients. Um, hyper consumerism and hyper consuming patients are a good hunting ground for the drug industry. Now, this is a, a, a snippet I took off from uh, the famous comic Asterix. Uh, if you just uh, look at the statement D, people will buy something to make the neighbors envious. We have to aim for D. So, um, uh, I have patients who just distribute their CT scan films amongst their neighbors just to show off. So uh, this has become a trend just to um, get a CT scan uh, without any absolute indication. Um, I also did a, a survey uh, assessing traditional remedies for uh, 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 knee osteoarthritis in our patients. And we just uh, assessed patients who had been on traditional treatment for knee osteoarthritis at least once while receiving Western medication. And we found that more than 52% of our patients had five or more sessions of traditional treatment um, uh, regimes, including Ayurveda or Desha Chikista, while being on our medication. So 52% per, uh, have, have had five or more sessions of traditional uh, treatment. Um, we also did a consultant-based survey on arthritis and related disease burden about two years ago at Anuradhapura. 61% of the consultants uh, disagreed to the statement that Sri Lankan patients in a rural province like North Central are keen on lifestyle modifications when it comes to osteoarthritis. 63% agreed that primary prevention of non-communicable diseases like osteoarthritis is difficult. 78% agreed to the statement that patients prefer temporary measures like pain relief medication rather than trying out preventive methods. And 32% named lack of enthusiasm and social stigma as obstacles in implementing walking cane use. And 56.5% agreed that polypharmacy without the awareness of, or interaction of the physicians was a grave problem among North Central Province patients. So this is what the consultants revealed in this survey. I'll just take one example, um, one main uh, uh, disease that is uh, 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 a thing that is uh, diagnosed uh, 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 a lot in uh, amongst our, our patients, chronic low back pain. The total cost uh, in US back in 2006 for chronic low back pain exceeded uh, US dollars more than 100 billion. This is the amount that we pay to buy more than 1,110 Boeing 737 aeroplanes. So it's 18 times the 2019 Sri Lankan annual budget expenditure. So you could just imagine the number of uh, the money that was wasted. And um, if you just time travel 300 years ago, the daily life of an average Sri Lankan citizen, uh, the, uh, if you consider the reasons for back pain, it might have been paddy cultivation because almost all did uh, some sort of cultivation. And uh, amidst temperatures as high as 35 degrees, uh, 70 days per season, two seasons per annum, daily two to six hours out in the sun, back pain was just a daily routine. No, it was not categorized as DC since, uh, of course, ICD system didn't exist. Um, and the mode of transport um, uh, 300 years ago was by foot. There was no requirement for activity vans. They had to be active in order to survive. The limousines of last year were different from what people own these days. Uh, fast forward 300 years, all of us are seated on comfortable chairs, uh, staring at a computer. Most of us are seated within artificial regulated temperature zones, which we call air conditioning. The chairs are equipped with lumbar supports, headrests, elbow supports, and lots of levers that we never utilize. And we discuss over diagnosis of musculoskeletal pain without focusing much on how our livelihoods have changed within the past 70 to 80 years. Um, now, the three-toed slug, this is a joke, by the way, uh, are, is the slowest mammal moving at a rapid pace of six to eight feet a minute. So, so I, I, I was just uh, thinking that soon humans might overrun slugs at the slowest places because of our underactivity. Now, how should we proceed going beyond a lecture on overdiagnosis? What I feel is we should educate both doctors as well as the general public and explaining harms 
risk of drug overuse should be done to doctors and a value of lifestyle modifications, which is the easiest treatable method for musculoskeletal pain in the majority should be emphasized. So keeping that in mind, um, I did several articles uh, several years ago, three years ago, uh, the importance of proper footwear to avoid foot pain, how to select a walking aid, how correct posture helps avoid spine pain, and also some Sinhalese articles uh, on uh, how not to use medication. And we have launched a, 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 a program where we promote uh, walking cane usage uh, amongst uh, patients who are attending my clinic in Andhradhapura, uh, just to cut down the pain relief medication because some people are dependent on painkillers. Having said all these, I now fairly in diagnosing certain critical rheumatological conditions like inflammatory arthritis, connective tissue disorders and vasculitis might lead to disaster. So these patients, these uh, specific group of patients need testing and bridging therapy and also initiation of DMARs. There's no question about it. Um, as mentioned earlier, a thorough evaluation is important in musculoskeletal conditions to diagnose these conditions. And are we to discuss the excellent health-seeking behavior that we see in our patients? We have an excellent health-seeking behavior boosted by cheap public transport, good hospital network, uh, field healthcare workers, etc. And this was disrupted during COVID lockdown phase. We have to encourage patients to present early if they have critical illnesses. So uh, another thing that I, I, I promote is promoting healthy aging. The label sarcopenia and osteopenia are normal aspects of aging, but now they have become diseases to be prevented and treated, unfortunately. So we have uh, again launched another project uh, to just defocus them off their pain syndromes, like planting tea pods in Andhradhapura. Uh, we, we give these to people, people who have osteoarthritis. In conclusion, um, now it's all about achieving a balance of uh, things uh, with the support from doctors as well as patients. And uh, I promote uh, the Goldilocks principle of things. Not too much medicine, not too little medicine, choosing the exactly right amount. These are my references, and thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Dr. Himanta, for that excellent, very different kind of view of overdiagnosis from your province. I think I think the problem that you, the the answers that you gave is uh, extremely cultural in our setting. So we want drive-through McDonald's type of treatment. You don't even stop. There has to be, when the patient gets home, there has to be improvement. Otherwise, so we'll have, to, uh, we'll have all questions later. I hope now uh, Dr. Shehan is ready. Hello. Yes, I'm ready. Uh, sorry for that. Uh, small mishap. There's many a twix, uh, many a slip twix the cup and lip. They say, um, uh, could you let me share the screen? Uh, I think we are, we are, uh, we can see you. We have okay. got this. Okay. All right. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Sorry again for the uh, mishap. Uh, I hope you can see my screen. Uh, my topic is based on. Older adults, do they deserve more? Let me first of all thank the SLMA for inviting me, uh, Professor Kumar Mendes' team, uh, to be a part of this uh, important uh, talk. And also, uh, I'm indeed privileged to be a, a member of this session. Uh, where two of my teachers are uh, in the panel, Professor uh, Saman Gurtrika and uh, Dr. Shamila De Silva. So I start off with a quotation from one of my favorite modern uh, day uh, physicians. Uh, William Osler uh, has uh, uh, quoted, one of the first things is to educate the masses not to take medicine. And I have inserted the in parenthesis, not to take inappropriate medicine. And indeed, uh, imperative drugging or what we talk as polypharmacy later on, uh, is, uh, has, is, is a modern day fashion. And ordering of medicines in any way for every malady 
is no longer as the chief function of the doctor. So when we talk about uh, management of a patient, not talking only about geriatric or older adults, I'm talking about patients all of uh, all age groups. Uh, we have a management paradigm and we see that if we provide treatment for those who have recent uh, overall uh, chance of benefit, we would uh, offer them appropriate commission of care. If we do not uh, provide treatment and uh, for those who have little chance of benefit, that is considered as appropriate omission of care. And again, if we do not provide treatment on the base of, uh, in, in the background of uh, reasonable overall chance of benefit, we may be causing potential ageism, especially in the older adults. But what we are cons cons considering here is about overdiagnosis and overtreatment. Treatment provided to those who have little chance of benefit. Overdiagnosis and overtreatment, a potential for discomfort, inconvenience, and wastage. As you know, aging is not only a chronological age, it is also composed of the biological age. And it's very essential that we uh, understand the concept of frailty as one age and as one encounter stressors, external stressors such as illness or injury. You see that as one age, there is a tendency for recovery to be slow. And, and when there is severe frailty, there is dependence. You see in the bottom of the screen, nine pictures. This is called the Edmonton scale, uh, where uh, frailty is depicted in nine different stages, just like Shakespeare's seven ages of a man. And if you move, picture yourself, your parents, or any older adult, maybe, your pa uh, maybe a patient, you'll be able to know where that person fits. So frailty is indeed a continuum. And when you talk about older adults, we deal with uh, uh, frailty as well as overmanagement, which occurs in overlapping situation. That is, and it's, it's essential that we consider about the patient's perspective when we manage them. So I will talk about prescription and about uh, therapeutics in this uh, session. As you know, prescription, a prescription or a management plan always deals with several factors. Whether we have come with a diagnosis and cons have considered management options, the age, the sex, the comorbidities and uh, the other interacting drugs that the patient may have. What about the drug factors, the pharmaco pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, the cost effectiveness and evidence-based practice, and also our prescriber factors. And after prescription, it is essential that we do patient counseling and monitoring. So the goals of therapy in our treat treatment uh, process management process has been curing diseases, relieving symptoms, replacing deficiencies, addressing lifestyle issues, and long-term prevention. And there is also a therapeutic trial or diagnosis. You see, uh, in the past, in the recent past, that there have been relaxing targets for older age and uh, limited life expectancies. You see on your left side uh, how uh, the glycemic targets have been brought down to less stringent uh, levels, especially when life expectancy is shortened or when there's comorbidities. In the same way, blood pressure lowering has been also questioned and also challenged in the realm of increasing uh, tendency of drawbacks and concerns. So we shift ourselves from Hello, I have a backup. I, I, 
Okay. Uh, yeah. Give me a moment. I, I'll share this. Can you see? Yeah. We can see you, Shahan, now. The camera uh, is my... on the screen yet. Let me uh, take this opportunity to thank Vihanga, uh, who is from the SLMA, uh, manipulating and uh, making things happen from Colombo. We are all in separate locations. Thank you, Vihanga, on behalf of the, he's from the SLMA. Uh, for organizing everything. Uh, we are running a little bit late on time. So that's not much of a problem because uh, we have got authority and the permission. Uh, are you ready, uh, Shan? Sorry. Um, have you let me share the content? Uh, uh, can you just press that? I'm using it from a uh from an ipad okay can you see a share screen button or can you email the thing to vihanga so that yeah he can... I, I will email it now give me a moment yeah so uh vihanga we will email the uh, presentation to you you can change the can you change the slides for dr shehan uh, if all the other speakers are okay, we have a few questions and there was, can we answer some of the questions? Now, first of all, there are lots of comments uh, from someone, Dr. Camila. So there's a person, I, it seems, I think this was openly advertise uh, one non-medical person is asking how can we as patients avoid so many diagnostic tests from doctors once they prescribe is there a mechanism to help us uh, one sundaresan I think we should uh, can some of our resource persons. Uh, Hello. You, will, we, take a will we get the oh, get the uh, presentation? Question was, was: How can we as patients avoid so many diagnostic tests from doctors once they prescribe? Is there a mechanism to help us? I think it should basically be a discussion between the doctor and the patient about why tests are done and what, what the outcome that is required out of those tests. I mean, patients do have a right to uh, question uh, why certain tests are being done. And I think we as doctors, we also have a, um, a duty to explain why we are doing certain tests, particularly the more expensive ones. So if there is good dialogue between the patient and the uh, physician who is looking after the patient, there shouldn't be a problem. I mean, there should be no irrational uh, investigations being prescribed. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Samila. And uh, there is a very nice uh, bit of advice given by choosing wisely. Uh, no. Uh, I will uh, probably uh, get this five questions you should ask your doctor. Uh, and we have kind of translated this into single Sehan, if you are ready. I'm just log in. Can you see me? Can you see me? Hello. No. 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 Share screen. No share screen. We can't. If you can uh, read, uh, allow me to do it from my yeah. Say share. Post as disabled participant screen sharing. Vihanga, 
Younger, there is another one. Oh, okay. okay. Now it is. We can yeah. see you. Okay. So our paradigm of uh, uh, treatment or managing a patient has changed now from comorbidity to multimorbidity. Uh, as you can see. As you can see, we have been having a... Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Can we can hear you, but there seems to be two mics on. Okay, sorry. So, uh, without much ado, uh, so our treatment has been uh, changed from... Uh, our management of patients have changed uh, from uh, accepting that there is a comorbidity where there are multiple diseases happening uh, in the realm of one index disease into multimorbidity. There are uh, many diseases act on a patient uh, in unison. So the previous uh, uh, philosophy of managing individual uh, diseases circling around one single disease has changed into managing multimorbidities. And multimorbidities are associated with polypharmacy, which we were talking about, which activates a prescri prescribing cascade, giving rise to adverse events. And there are uh, concerns of inappropriate prescription. I take, with the, I'll take you with a case, Mr. P, who is 85 years of age, lives along with his wife and daughter. He has a background of hypertension, chronic angina, osteoarthritis, prosthetic hyperplasia, and dementia, which is of mild degree. He is diagnosed of having iron deficiency anemia and has chronic constipation. His activities of daily living and instrumental activities of daily living are quite satisfactory and he's found to have a high, a high blood pressure of 170 over 80. The rest of the examination is normal. This creatinine is satisfactory and you see that the electrolytes are fine and the hemoglobin is 12 grams per decimal. Mr. P's drug sack consists of these drugs, aspirin, nifedipine, tamsulucin, atorvastatin, risperidin, ramipril, iron, diltiazem, and lactic. This is the story that we see most often. The daughter who lives in Australia sends him uh, fish oil, glucosamine, the modern uh, fashion, CBD oil, multivitamins, calcium, vitamin D extracts, and CA algae extracts for memory boost. So what are the problems that we see in this patient? So we see that there is duplication of drugs from the same class, there are two calcium channel blockers. You see that he comes with constipation, and this may be because of calcium channel blockers along with iron therapy. He has a hemoglobin of 12, and he is still continuing iron therapy despite this. His blood pressure is high, so what can we do? We could stop the calcium channel blockers and titrate up ramipril as his renal functions are satisfied. Later on, the family notices that Mr. P is very slow and there are some tremors in the hand. And uh, this is because of the antipsychotic that he is on, causing extrapyramidal symptoms. But he is seen by his family doctor who commences him on Parkinson's drugs. And you see that this is the phenomenon of prescribing cascade. One drug causing adverse effects, which makes the clinician to misinterpret it as a new medical condition, giving him thoughts of putting another drug, giving rise to more and more adverse effects going down the hill. Other examples of prescribing cascades are uh, patients who are on cholinesterase inhibitors who have increased ch chance of uh, subsequent uh, incontinence. Uh, 
uh, and requ requiring anticholinergic drugs. Patients who are on cardioselective uh, beta blockers like bisoprolol initiated while having beta, uh, beta agonists such as salbutamol. So Mr. P later on comes while on levodopa, carbidopa, having a fall. This is because of dizziness and imbalance, and there is no physical injury, uh, including fractures. So his drugs have been thereafter rationalized, and you see the, the pill burden has been brought down to three. Aspirin, Tamipril, which is up titrated to five milligrams twice a day, and the Tamsilus, and the other drugs, including his Australian supplements have been terminated. So potentially inappropriate prescribing can, uh, can be there uh, with greater number of risks versus benefits. And we see that there is a realm of overprescription, excessive doses and du duration, long durations, causing polypharmacy. Patients may be wrongly prescribed inappropriate drugs, doses and duration and also they can be under prescribed. Just like adding more and more drugs, we might be uh, keeping a patient off a necessary drug. So what do we have to do? Does it do our priorities of treatment reflect the therapeutic goals? Do, do we consider about alternatives such as pharmacological and non-pharmacological means? And do we think about drug-to-drug -drug interactions, and also about the dosing, dosage, frequency, and formulation. So polypharmacy is an essential uh, phenomenon that we need to be wary of. This is prescribing more than four drugs, and this is independently associated with adverse effects. And it is shown that falls and fractures, as well as hospital admissions and um, uh, institutionalization is increased. There's also increased drug to drug and drug to disease interaction. Reduced physical and cognitive capabilities giving rise to reduced quality of life uh, misery and initiation of more and more prescribing cascades with duplication. Added to this the cost. Are we doing this? This is a simple uh, practice that we ought to do brown bag analysis. When somebody comes to our table, our desk, do we regularly review the medication with the patient's view? Do we look at whether the patient is duplicated or having expired medication? And do we try to decipher whether the patient is on over-the-counter medication, including complementary and alternative therapy? Is polypharmacy always e evil? So in certain instances, multiple medication can be appropriate and may be beneficial. Sometimes it's clinically indicated for conditions like diabetes, but, but is there evidence of low evidence or benefit more than harm? Are we also uh, using polypharmacy in, in a way to control the patient's uh, problems, as in the big, the major concerns that the patients may have. For instance, pain. Do we use other alternative medications instead of NSAIDs, such as uh, antidepressants and muscle antagonists to spare, to have an analgesic sparing? So appropriate polypharmacy is prescribing is needed for prescribing for complex and multiple conditions based on best evidence. And we ought to achieve specific therapeutic objectives to preserve safety and well-being of patients. And the patients should be motivated and be able to tolerate. So as you know that evidence-based medicine is composed of three uh, circles, three realms. Most of us, we have clinical judgment and the backing from our knowledge of scientific evidence at a greater level. But do we consider about patients' values and preferences? 
is a practice rather than being evidence based medicine traversing from eminence based medicine eloquence based medicine to or to vehemence based medicine. so there are various tools that are useful more more useful in the older adults you get the bs criteria or the stop start uh, uh, criteria consensus where you need, can use these consensus to see whether our prescription our treatment regimes are appropriate stop i would like to talk a little bit more about the uh, stop and start consensus stop consensus deals with screen deals as a screening tool of older persons potentially inappropriate prescription and the start tool is about alerting a doctor to initiate the right treatment and this has been really, uh, modified to a criteria for sri lanka by a team of our very own uh, doctors here and i would like to take you with some important concerns offering in the in the base of chronic atrial fibrillation do we consider about the chadwas score or the hasblet hasblet score in treating our patients hypertensives antihypertensives when the systolic blood pressure is more than 160 provided that the patient does not have any other risk factors especially of falling down such as in postural hypertension as inhibitors in chronic heart failure and in acute myocardial infarction beta blockers in chronic angina statins a very important area that needs to be uh, concerned of in vasculopathy when activities of daily living are independent and when life expectancy is more than 5 years these are appropriate prescriptions and about starting maybe proton pump in inhibitors in severe reflux or in strictures using fiber to uh, patients uh, who have symptomatic diverticular disease and constipation for those who are on steroids are we considering the use of bisphosphonates and also calcium and vitamin d in those diagnosed of osteoporosis there are various other tools that can be used for instance the bnf hardly ever used by majority of the doctors we think that we know everything about our medication what we have but we need to we ought to look up there is also a, a free website called electronic medicines compendium uh, which uh, is a very useful tool in finding out uh, drug related prescription related issues when it comes to our therapies so i leave with four tips less is more we ought to we, we to think about uh, more is merrier but having less is considered more question ourselves whether the patient needs a particular medication we might have to consider stopping medication and prioritizing treatment and as i have stated before risk versus benefit has to be taken into account and we should not deprive a patient uh, from severe debilitating problems such as pain and vomiting avoid under treating pain and vomiting and other symptoms that are associated do we consider about non pharmacological approach and also consider about the patients over the counter medication when a patient comes to us with a certain medical issue do we consider about the adverse effects as the etiology for uh, the new signs and symptoms Con do we consider about discontinuing or reducing dose doses a bold decision we need to start slow and go slow this is a this is a, diff, uh, a very important slogan that uh, is practiced in geriatrics start on one medication at one time start at a lower dose 
and go up the ladder gradually while monitoring for response and adverse effect. Do we assess adherence? Do we think about patient's perception, how the patient thinks about the therapy, about us as a doctor, as the prescriber? Do we consider about the physical, cognitive, and psychological impairments, the language and literacy? Uh, how are we dealing with costs, especially to those who are elderly, depending on, dependent on a measly pension? And how do these drugs affect the quality of life? Deprescription is an important concept that we need to learn, both at medical school as well as uh, in our continuous professional development. We need to assess the patient, as I reiterate, define the treatment goals, identify the inappropriate medication, assess for risks and benefits, stop and reduce dosages. Do we consider about communicating with our fellow prescribers. Sometimes we wonder whether we should talk with a, a junior doctor or we shudder whether we should speak to a senior mo a more doctor about the adequacy or the appropriateness of medication that we see in the patients that we commonly manage. And thereafter, we ought to monitor and adjust as appropriate. So a few take home pills. We have to be mindful of frailty and old age in relationship to uh, comorbidities. Do we practice appropriate polypharmacy? Look up on uh, certain things like renal um, dosages, uh, looking up on a formulary such as the British National Formulary or the Electronic Medicine Compendium, which I shared with you. The four principles, less is more in prescription. Think about drugs as a cause for adverse events. Start low and go slow and check on the concordance. And we ought to learn to be deep prescribe. And with this a quotation from Thomas Edison, the doctor of the future will not prescribe drugs. Instead, he will awaken the interests of the patient towards his body, as well to the reason and the possibility of preventing the disease. Is this an unrealistic thought? I do not give an answer for that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Shahan, for the, the lecture. And, and especially, we uh, it will be important to uh, at least 15 to 20% of people, including me, who are over 60. So uh, we, have, uh, a f we have a lot of questions. Thank you for all 110 participants that attended this within the first 15 minutes. The people, the, the persons at present has dropped to about 77. There are a lot of comments, but we got two main questions. The first question to answer, I will uh, share my screen. Uh, Vihanga, can I share the screen now? Okay, so hopefully you will see the uh, answer to the question. One uh, non-medical person asked this question and Dr. Shamila gave the answer. This is the five questions. Hopefully, can all of you see my screen now? So this is the, the very interesting uh, five questions to ask your doctor. This is from the American Board of uh, Specialists. Uh, if you go to a doctor, they advise you to ask your doctor before you get any test, treatment or procedure. Do I really need this test or procedure? What are the risks? Are there simpler, safe options? What happens if I do not, if I don't do anything? And how much does it cost? So we have translated this and we will be putting this on the website. So the next question comes from 
Dr. Chandimal. From a family medicine point of view, I have a concern in regard the regards of early diagnosis. As the studies only looked at, at the clinical outcomes with no such difference in mortality and morbidity. Still, I think it will be it will have significant positive impact on, on the sociological and psychological outcomes. It is a question and a comment addressed to myself and Dr. Uh, Shamila De Silva. Shamila, if you can give an, your view. The, I, I think uh, what uh, Dr. Chandimal is asking is a uh, significant positive impact on sociological and psychological outcomes on an individual basis, probably, from what I understand from the question. Uh, now, again, this is what we were talking about. This anxiety that people have that they may have some undiagnosed malignancy or some undiagnosed condition. Uh, it's a sort of a pervasive anxiety that a lot of people have. And uh, I think, you know, this uh, current climate of where, you're cons where, where people are constantly advertising uh, various packages saying this needs to be picked up, this needs to be picked up is adding to that anxiety. So uh, I don't know whether there are any studies whether which have looked at the sociological or psychological outcomes of early testing. You know, what I have come across so far have always looked at the mortality and morbidity in the long term, you know, um, sort of solid outcomes, if I may say so, you know, sort of solid, solid outcomes, which are mortality and morbidity. So whether early diagnosis actually has a positive impact on the psychological outcome, I really don't know. I have not read anything about that. It's a, an area that we probably need to look at, whether it makes people less anxious whether it, you know, whether their health seeking behavior changes because of uh, doing frequent testing and coming to early diagnosis. I haven't come across anything looking at these aspects. Uh, Prof. Kumar, have you read anything on these things? Uh, I think, uh, Dr. Samila, you had a slide, I think a very interesting slide from, I think, uh, a Lancet regarding the screening. Yes. 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 But yes. They compare, but when we do uh, have people with positive uh, mammography, and then it is a false positive, uh, and the amount of anxiety and worry that they, uh, I mean, the psychological outcomes of a, uh, maybe they are at first pleased that they get. Uh, very positive results early and they have followed this kind of patients and it's a huge burden psychologically because once you have labeled and once somebody tells you especially after a mammogram that there may be a slight area that we are suspicious and then once a year once in two years once in three years they keep on doing the, the biopsies and the patients are never left out of the mentality that I am a breast cancer patient. This is the little uh, of uh, very solid evidence that we have. The, this is why in Switzerland, the government took a bold step. It happened about five years ago. The breast screen is not done now. That was a very good Somebody can argue that that's, uh, Switzerland is a very rich country. Resources they can, uh, they can, they have all the facilities to uh, uh, provide uh, surgery if needed. But that's it. The evidence is we just can't. And to tell you, this month is a breast screen. I think. Uh, correct me if I am wrong. It is. And it is. And the Ministry of Health has a wonderful guideline, up-to-date guideline. It says very specifically 50 plus. If you don't have any rela rela relations, uh, that first big relations, start breast screening. If you read the 
90% of advertisement they tend to go as low as 30 and almost all private hospitals it is 40 plus i mean 10 years what we are what are we doing they have lowered the ministry of health guideline i am not talking about american or uk these are own ministry of health guidelines they lower the age 10 years so we have another question i will just from dr nurendra it's about patients information leaflet which comes with medicine how much reading to this a patient must undertake particularly in terms of side effects due to the fact that the literature supplied in the leaflet can sound very scary or complex at times should patients leave that complex area entirely to their doctors who are subscribing the medicine or and or try to make some sense or connections to some side effects on their own thank you can i can i Yes. I would like to answer that, sir. Um, uh, very good question. Uh, uh, this, uh, uh, I suppose, patient information leaflet should be more uh, simple, simpler. Uh, if if you see how the patient information leaflets uh, are provided uh, in the West, especially in UK, they are sort of in a very simplified manner, sort of uh, bullet form. And they would have the main important risk factors, the, the, the adverse effects uh, printed in there. And uh, also, if there is a provision uh, that uh, they could be counseled upon by the doctor or maybe a clinical pharmacist, I suppose the, the the anxiety that they would encounter by reading a longer list could be averted. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Shan. Uh, any, any other speakers? Want yes, uh, 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 Himant, yeah. shall I add something, uh, Prof? Because I, I feel that uh, uh, the leaflets uh, should be uh, trilingual. Now we see uh, all the leaflets, um, almost all, except for a very few are. Um, uh, um, like uh, printed in English language, which the patient doesn't comprehend. So I suggest that uh, these things should be uh, in all three languages to, for the patient to easily understand. So um, that's, uh, I think, a huge deficit that we see. You know, West, in West, they can understand their language, but here, English language is, uh, I think it's uh, nearly uh, almost uh, it's difficult for uh, to be understood by the general public. So uh, just a suggestion. Okay, there's uh, one final uh, comment uh, that just came in from the list. I will just read this. Early diagnosis and improved quality of life, although mortality is a statistic. Study. Static. Early diagnosing and improved quality of life, although mortality is static. Please comment. Does that mean uh, the questionnaire is equating early diagnosis with improved quality of life? Uh, yes, Shamila, this is uh, uh, just a comment that no, came uh, on the panel. Yeah. With the early diagnosis, and we are trying to improve quality of life, but the mortality remains static. Right. So, but he may be meaning is, uh, I think again, somebody showed a slide that I think thyroid cancer in Korea. That was me again, South yeah. Korea. No South change in the mortality, Korea. but massively increased Actually, screening yeah. levels. If you can just explain, uh, Dr. Shamila, that is the thing I think is. Now, the, the, the point here that I wanted to make was making a diagnosis of something like, you know, screening for a thyroid uh, nodule and then uh, finding a thyroid nodule, screening it to see whether it is uh, thyroid carcinoma, uh, probably will not equate an improvement in the quality of life and does not 
contribute to improving mortality. Some cancers, now let, let's be really clear about this, that the, the data, the information, the evidence is in only for certain scenarios, not for everything. So we, there are instances where in specified situations like uh, breast cancer screening after a particular age when there is a positive family history where the benefits far outweigh the risks and the psychological turmoil that it can cause. But whether that same principle applies across the board to all, all cancers, early detection of all cancers is probably not so. And that is why I showed that example of uh, uh, thyroid cancer screening in, in uh, South Korea where they have picked up a whole lot of cases, but mortality has remained unchanged. So again, these are areas that we need to look at because not only are mortality figures, uh, you know, you, you have general mortality figures which you can give for the whole world, but obviously there will be differences in those figures, uh, long-term outcome, depending on which part of the world, which population you're looking at. So these are areas that we as physicians and researchers should look at in greater detail. Okay, thank you. I think I will ask the last question from the panel. So we have just concluded the second seminar. Where are we going from here? What can we do to at least minimize the overdiagnosis and too much medicine. I think uh, there are various things that we can do. Uh, it's over to uh, Prof. Saman as the senior most uh, professor and a medical educator and a, and a clinician that uh, sees patients. Uh, what are your yeah. recommending? How can you move this forward? Well, I, I think uh, one is to have regular meetings which are maybe open to public so that we can target it more to public, whereas today was mostly on medical. Sorry, we dropped your... Have we dropped Dr. Uh, Professor Saman Gunatilaka. We have Right. Can you? All ah, right. Now, right. now. Right. Yeah. So, like I said, like what uh, Himanta has done, have certain leaflets which are educational materials, and maybe uh, the health ministry should take an initiative and try and you know have it available to all the patients and regular me meetings like this. Uh, uh, I think maybe the way forward. At the same time, there should be kind of uh, doctor education programs where doctors should be, you know, made aware that their prescriptions, prescriptions are not really right. Because as uh, Himanta said, gabapentin and pregabalin are widely abused. I, it's, I mean, the, that's due to being the drug being promoted at general practice levels to even uh, headache treatment, uh, any, any pain, which is not right. So there are problems and I think maybe these are some of the ways we can uh, handle this. Okay, uh, who will comment next? How can we move this forward? That was my question. Dr. Himanta, if you... Yes, you had um, yeah. yes um, actually, uh, I, I spoke earlier on this as well. Uh, educating the junior doctors, uh, um, as well as the general public, the patients, and creating a bit of awareness is the, like, uh, it should be our next step, uh, I suppose, uh, carrying the message forward. I know this uh, lecture is available on in Facebook as well in a general uh, like a public platform. So I think most even the general public could access this uh, video later on from the SLMA Facebook page. So, but um, I think um, doing things like even newspaper articles on uh, 
um, this might be very useful so uh, that's uh, uh, my opinion on how to uh, so just uh, carrying the message forward uh, to the patients and general public in a, in a simplified form so that they uh, they will understand the message and um, so that's what i um, thought of you if i may add something i think the other area that we need to probably focus on would be the medical education medical students because they are the they are the future of, of medicine in this country so uh, some degree of integration of what we have been talking about into the medical curriculum is also something that we should probably be thinking in the long term adding to Thank that you, uh, what uh, uh, madam dr shamil shamila de silva mentioned uh, like what i stated in my uh, presentation we should uh, especially the junior doctors and the medical students you should say that tell them uh, advocacy should be there to say that de prescribing or prescribing less is better than having a whole gamut of medication or treatment options the, uh, i think that's an essential part of uh, training okay uh, that brought to a close this uh, seminar i want to thank all participants there was a huge i expected only a maximum of 50 uh, and especially there were some particular doctors uh writing and uh, commenting and answering questions maybe dr chandrani chandani liana gama was one and to thank all participants and to our resource panel i was was frankly surprised that you uh, for you express your views were in no uncertain terms thank you very much again and the slm may for giving this opportunity and bihanga again thank you for making uh, and dr sukun here at the controls thank you very much and have a pleasant day thank you thank you thank you